So thank you everybody for attending today. Uh, we had over 800 registrants, so appreciate everybody's support for this event. It is titled Examining Bartonella, and we have uh, Dr. Joseph Barascano with us today. He is a well-recognized specialist in the diagnosis and treatment of Lyme and associated complex infectious diseases and the other chronic illnesses that may accompany them. Uh, with over two decades of experience and research in the field, he has appeared in, on, or virtually in every form of media, has advised the CDC and NIH, testified before the U.S. Senate, Armed Service Subcommittee and at various governor's councils. He is a founding member of ILADS uh, and is an active board member as well. So thank you so much for being with us today, Dr. Barascano. And I'll go ahead and, and turn it over to you and mute myself because I think there's some construction happening upside. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> hi everyone and thank you for joining. I'm gonna share the screen. Um, here we go. And one more. There it is, all right. I'm going to minimize my face so I'm not distracted. <laughs> okay, so again, thank you everyone for joining. Um, I'm going to talk tonight about Bartonella. Um, very complex um, topic, and I'm going to go through the beginnings of it pretty quickly because I don't want to waste time on basics because I do want to get into the meat and potatoes of it more or less. Um, so a lot of you know this already. It's a very difficult um, illness to diagnose and treat. Um, part of the thing that is perplexing is that there's so many different ones. I gave this presentation about 18 months ago and the topic was 45 different species. <laughs> then it became um, 35, then it became 40, and then 45 so far and maybe even more. And there are at least a dozen, maybe 15 that are known to infect humans and probably more as we get better testing. Another very important thing, it makes biofilm really a lot and that um, adds to the chronicity of the disease, interferes with treatment and even interferes with testing as well. As a lot of you know, it's very common in Lyme and tick-borne disease patients, always has to be considered as a possible co-infection. And bites, even red ants, obviously animal bites and scratches, um, needle sticks and maternal fetal as well. Um, worldwide distribution, check this out. It was found above the Arctic Circle in Arctic foxes and the fleas in the nests I'll show you my pointer. This is the Nineveh village. And look at this. Let me zoom out. It's like way up there. So in county, so these are just the positives they've gotten. If you probably, if you um, surveyed all the labs, I'm sure this map would be much more dense than you see here. So a question, can you get it from a tick bite? Yep. They um, did this experimentally between um, the tick and mice. And then there's a case report you can see on the bottom of someone who got a tick bite and got lymphadenopathy and a, a rash, and they found it was Bartonella from the tick. So yes, you can get it from tick bites. Is it common? Nobody knows. This is nothing that I found, that they have found Bartonella in the salivary glands of ticks, especially if they're partially engorged. And the importance of that is that ticks inject their saliva as soon as they pierce the skin. So it's possible that Bartonella can be transmitted right away and not have to be, um, the tick may not have to be on it for hours or days. It may be transmitted right away to get Bartonella. Diagnosis is tough. Um, symptoms are not specific. There are very few things that are um, specific for Bartonella. It's a very well-known cause of fever of unknown origin, and it can even cause infection of the heart valve for Bartonella endocarditis can be found in the blood, in the spinal fluid, in the GI tract, including the appendix, the liver, the skin, the bone, even the uh, periarticular bone itself. Um, cartilage, lymph nodes can be found in stem cells, as I mentioned, heart valves. We know that it can be transmitted from mother to baby. Um, if people have autoimmune disease, it can make it worse, or if they don't, they can acquire it from this infection. Another very interesting thing, we can activate what's called vascular endothelial growth factor. It's something that stimulates the growth of blood vessels. And we know that, for example, in inflammatory breast cancer, Bartonella is probably what's activating it to become inflammatory. And extra growth of blood vessels not only is a problem, but also you can use this VEGF test to monitor the infection. It's not elevated in every Bartonella patient, but if it is, you can monitor that. And as the infection, is treated, if it's successfully treated, the VEGF level goes down. 
All right. Um, clinical picture, four key findings. In the central nervous system, the CNS symptoms are out of proportion to the physical ones. For example, if you have a Lyme patient with no Bartonella, the Lyme is joints, it's neurologic, it's um, fatigue, it's headaches. Um, and everything seems to be more or less in balance, although it does vary obviously over time. But in Bartonella, the CNS symptoms are way out of proportion um, to them. Also, the, the involvement is soft tissues, for example, the tissues around the joint and really not a thickened synovium like you see in Lyme disease. Um, it can involve the GI tract and the eyes. So in the CNS, it's a combination of dysfunction and extreme irritability. They can be rage attacks, anxiety, panic attacks, insomnia, can affect mood in terms of depression. Because of the stimulation of causes, there can be tremors, seizures, even pseudo seizures and staggering gait. Um, this irritability can cause some really bad antisocial behavior. I've seen it in my own patients. Even hallucinations can mimic schizophrenia and dementia. And as a lot of you have found out, um, can be an inciting event in pans and even eating disorders that's been reported. Very peculiar skin manifestations. Um, Bartonella tracks, I'll show you some pictures of that. Oh, let me go back. Um, there we go. Um, another skin rash is called bacillary angiomatosis, which are red bumps that can scab over. I have a picture. If you biopsy these rashes, you can find the Bartonella, and very often in the tracks, you find Borrelia there as well. And some have related um, Bartonella co infections with the Morgellon disease. In terms of GI involvement, it's not just gastritis like H. pylori, but it can infect the lymph glands around the small intestine. It's called mesenteric adenitis and be a cause of small intestine or mid abdominal pain. Other clinical clues. Um, if the temperature is monitored, which I often have my Lyme patients do, Lyme patients are often below normal in the morning and a little above more, uh, normal in the afternoon. Here, it's just the opposite. Um, if my patients report 99, 99.2 when they wake up in the morning, um, that's a clue. Obviously not hard and fast, but it's a clue. There can be some night sweats, very light, not like the easy way you're really sweating a lot. This can be like the hot, cold, hot, cold kind of thing. General symptoms, headache, peripheral neuropathy, fatigue, tendon nodules along the fascia under the skin. You can run your hand along your outer thigh and feel these. Soles can be sore in the morning. You have to hobble around till you get used to it. Um, it's more of a tendonitis than an arthritis, and there can be pain in the bone itself. As I mentioned before, the painful joints, when the doctor examines it, you don't find the thickened synovial lining, the, the lining of the joint. You find the joints are painful because of the soft tissues. In the GI tract gastritis, like I mentioned, which is heartburn-like H. pylori, mid-abdominal pain from the lymph glands being affected. And in fact, lymph glands can be affected anywhere, including under the arms and so forth. And I've actually had one patient who was diagnosed incorrectly with lymphoma, it turned out to be Bartonella. Antibiotics made it go away. He did not need chemotherapy. Another very important area is the eyes. Pretty much any part of the eye can be in infected and affected. Uveitis, retinitis, and clots in the retinal artery and even in the vein of the, of the retina. How about some clinical clues? Well, one of the things that I look for is unexpected response to Lyme treatments. For example, if you have a patient who you think has Lyme, but it's really Bartonella or predominantly Bartonella, you put them on Lyme treatments, they don't get better, nothing happens. Well, because you're treating the wrong germ and maybe the Lyme medicine is not working for Bartonella. Or maybe you have a patient who's been under treatment for Lyme and they improve to a point, but they don't get beyond that. Um, because again, Lyme medications may inhibit Bartonella, but may not kill it. Another thing is if Lyme patient is under treatment and treatment is stopped, if the diagnosis is correct and it's Lyme, if you stop treatment early, the symptoms take some time to start to come back. Um, with Bartonella, however, that happens much more quickly. So for example, patient on treatment stops antibiotics, week or two or three goes by and then finally start feeling the old symptoms come back. That's kind of the time course for Lyme. If you stop treatment within a week, things are back or four or five days, to me, that's a clue for Bartonella. That's why I have my patients keep a diary um, to see what happens if treatment is stopped and if the plateaus are hit. Neuropsychiatric Bartonella, big topic. Um, here's a, a study published by Dan Kindler. Um, he randomly took um, 10 adolescents at a psych residential treatment center, just randomly picked them, um, and he studied them with serology. 
two out of 10, 20% had group A strep, th two out of 10 had Lyme, evidence of Lyme Bartonella, uh, uh, Borrelia, and three out of 10 had Bartonella. Um, now, the importance of this is that 30% pickup rate, that's about how sensitive Bartonella tests are. So the actual rate may be much higher. 90% of them, nine out of 10, had an abnormal Cunningham panel, which showed there were antineuronal antibodies um, causing neuroinflammation. That's probably why they're having the psychiatric symptoms. Another one, this is from one of Ed Breitschwert's articles, fatigue, insomnia, memory loss, and or disorientation, blurred vision, loss of coordination, headaches, and depression were the most common symptoms. We also found seizures, paresis, which is a, a very profound weakness, and debilitating migraines were the predominant symptoms in three of them. Some of them, two of them had symptoms that persisted for three to five years. So we know it's chronic. This is an article from um, Marty Fried. Um, he tested 81 pediatric patients aged eight to 21. Um, their symptoms were abdominal pain, reflux, heartburn, and maybe even blood in the stool. What he did was he did PCR biopsies of the stomach, duodenum, and colon. Of the 81, 26 had no infection that he could detect, but all the rest found infection. 37% had one, 24% had two infections, and 8%, six of the 81, had three infections. Of these 81, 35 of them were Bartonella. 24 had mycoplasma fermentans, 14 had H. pylori, and 13 had Bibidorferi. Interestingly, again, these were PCRs of the, of the GI biopsies, but in every single patient, all the serology tests for Bartonella were negative. Stool tests were negative too. So in other words, one more example of how poor serologic testing had been. Now, things have gotten better. I'll show you that in a minute. So here's a Bartonella of the skin. This is the, the red bumps I talked about, the bacillary angiomatosis. These can scab over, they can be sore, they can bleed. And these are the famous Bartonella tracks. They look like stretch marks superficially, but you see a few changes. Number one, stretch marks are usually skin color or actually pale, whitish. Here, they're reddened. Um, the other thing is they don't follow skin planes. Another picture, um, this not only shows what I just mentioned, but stretch marks are straight. These are wiggly and, and serpiginous. So that's another clue. Here's one. You can see that the skin is not just reddened, but actually there's a depression, like there's atrophy, and that's because of damage to the collagen from the infection. And here's one where they got mixed. You got both the bumps <laughs> and the uh, tracks. And again, you can biopsy these lesions and find the organisms. But now, as I mentioned, creates biofilm. Here are just some very basic slides to show it. These have not only been found in tissues, but also in the bloodstream. You can see these large, almost rafts of, um, of blood cells and biofilm and embedded Bartonella as it floats through. And that can really Im impair circulation, especially in the capillaries, lungs, brain, so forth. Testing, big testing problems. So with Bartonella, there are two basic types of tests, the indirect test and the direct test. An indirect test measures the immune response to the infection. These are the serologies and the T cell response assays. The direct test is a direct um, detection of the organism itself. And the two we have are the fish, the fluorescent in situ hybridization, and the PCR. Now there's a reciprocal or back and forth relationship between these two types. If your immune system is weak, um, the indirect tests like serologies may give you a false negative. But then again, if you have a weak immune system, there probably are more organisms. So the direct tests like the fish and the PCR actually may be, may be more sensitive. Now the reverse is also true. In patients with PCR negative, do the serology because a low PCR might mean a strong immune system, therefore you have a good positive serology. But none of these tests are 100% sensitive and most doctors um, do order both types of tests at the same time. Now standard serologies like you'd get from one of the big commercial labs is notoriously insensitive. Number one, they use old fashioned technology like IFAs in America, ELISAs in Europe, and number two, they usually test only for one species, not the 12 to 15 we know can infect humans and maybe 40 or more, 45 around the world. Um, so one serotype of one species, usually Bartonella hensley, sometimes Quintana, or you have to order, order that separately. And based on the studies I've read, the sensitivities average about 28%. Clinically, that's kind of what I've been seeing. 
In the case of Bartonella infecting the lining of the heart, the endocarditis, one report showed a sensitivity as high as 91%, but that was just one report, and I'm not so sure I believe it. So the standard serology is not only not sensitive, they're also not specific. Now here's a study, um, the references on the bottom. 36% of the positive Bart Bartonella serologies were not from the Bartonella. It was a false positive because of chlamydia. You can get false positives 24% of the time in this study from Epstein-Barr, from CMV, Coxiella, strep, pyogenes, the strep throat can give you false positive Bartonella serology. Different articles showed tularemia and even toxoplasmosis can give a false positive on a standard serology. Why is that? Number one, with serologies is a trade-off between sensitivity and specificity, and the labs set up what they call a cutoff value. And if you looked at your lab results of these standard IFAs, for example, you see a number like a, a tide of one to 20, one to 40, one to 80. So what's positive and what's negative? Well, if you say one to 160 is positive, well, you're not gonna be very sensitive. You're gonna miss a lot, but the ones that are positive are gonna be really a true positive. But if you say, wait, I want a more sensitive test you make a lower cutoff, one to 80, even one to 40, yeah, you're gonna get a lot more positives, but you're gonna get also some more false positives. So that's what the problem is. Because of this, some labs have been very active in developing better tests. Um, the better serology is called an immunoblot, and I'll show you data on that. A direct test that's better is the FISH test. And that is also good because it directs the genus of Bartonella. So in other words, it picks up all the different species. And Galaxy has come up with a droplet digital PCR, which makes the PCR at least six times more sensitive than the standard one. I'll show you some data on that. So we'll talk about the immunoblot, we'll talk about that first. It is a serology, but it's completely different from the standard IFAs and the ELISAs because it doesn't, it's not made from germs grown in test tubes. It's actually made from recombinant proteins that are created in the lab. And these are very, very specific Bartonella proteins. Um, so it causes increased sensitivity without the trade-off of specificity. So you can get a very specific and sensitive test at the same time. It's also been engineered to identify a broad range of species that are clinically important. And not only will it identify them as a positive, but the ones that they can actually show you what species is, Hensley, Quintana, Elizabethan, and Vinsonii. And this can actually show you if you're co-infected with more than one species. And it does report both IgM and IgG. So that's pretty neat. Right, so what's this recombinant business? There's synthetic antigens created in the lab that are identical to what's in Bartonella. So that's why it's so very specific. You're not gonna get cross reactivity with, for example, toxoplasmosis, like I showed you in that other article. Um, and the, the way they do it, I wanna get too much detail, but what they first do is identify the DNA sequences in Bartonella that codes for the proteins they want. Then they synthesize those strands, use a virus vector to put them into DNA, their DNA into E. coli, then the E. coli is grown in culture and they make these pure protein antigens. So it's a complicated process, but you get a very pure result. And here's the performance of that. 46 um, uh, samples were studied. And as you can see from the top in black, patients who had Lyme, five of them, no, no cross reactivity with Bartonella. In other words, no false positive. And that's Lyme TBRF, Lyme Babesia, um, anaplasma, Babesia alone, and controls, none of them showed a false positive. So specificity was 100%. Now, when you want to look for sensitivity, the problem here with both this type of test and you see with the PCR is that there's no gold standard. So how do you, have, how do you know you have a positive? Well, what they did here, they found patients were positive by fish and IFA and Western blot. And sure enough, the immunoblot picked up all of them. Here they did IFA in Western blot or fish in Western blot in every case they picked it up. And overall, when they do this type of testing, again, the specificity was 100%. Sensitivity for IgM was 75%, IgG 89, and if you say M or G together, they picked up all of them with this type of a study. But again, there's no gold standard. Um, so this is very good in a lab sense, clinically pretty close. Now, how about PCR? The PCR detects whether the DNA of the Bartonella is in the sample you've tested. The standard PCR has a very low sensitivity. In this one article, um, showed only six out of 112 were picked up, basically 5%. What Galaxy's done is they've made a much better PCR 
called the droplet digital PCR. And what they do is they break up the, the blood into microscopic droplets, where basically from one sample, they're doing 20,000 separate PCRs. And they found it was six times better. In other words, 30% sensitivity. Um, what they did also was they would then collect samples at three different time points during a week, let them grow in culture, and sample them at 7, 14, and 21 days. And while going through all that, they raised the sensitivity to 47%. So definitely it's better than the standard PCR. The fish, the fluorescent in situ, this is a direct test. They actually take your blood and they put on a blood smear on a glass slide, and then they apply stains that are RNA-based stains um, that glow in the, in the, um, under the microscope in a black light. So the beauty of this is that it's a direct detection, can actually see the organism. So I'll show you a picture. Another very important thing is that this will detect pathogens even if they're in biofilms. It's not been reported whether PCRs can do this, but it's been known for decades that fish is something that will detect even biofilm hidden organisms. And this is also using a, a RNA probe that's specific for the genus. In other words, it can pick up many, many different species. It's been validated for the numbers listed here, hence like Quintana, Vinsonia, Elizabethi, Graham, Hemi, and Brokofia, and others are even possible. But again, we don't have a gold standard to know how many of these can be picked up, but being genus specific, it's probably gonna pick up a lot. Here's some pictures. Um, his partner, Hans Lier, again, is Quintana and the negative control. Um, all the positives were, concern, were confirmed by DNA sequencing, PCR and sequencing, so they really were positive. And in terms of performance, the specificity was 100%. In other words, it did not cross-react with Babesia, different Babesias, Borrelias, malaria, trypanosomes, all these other ones that did not cross-react. And in terms of inclusivity, these were PCR and DNA sequencing confirmed infections with Vinsonia, hence like Quintana, Grammy, Elizabethi, and another one that couldn't identify the species, and it picked up all of them. So it's a good test um, to do if you have a patient with active infection. The other test that can be done, it's not done that often, but it's based on T cell response. Um, an IGNX, so it's called an IGX spot. Again, it's genus specific, so it can pick up many different species. T cell responses are not like serologies. The T cells respond first, even before B cells. So way before you get a positive serology, you can get a positive T cell test. So it's very good for early, early disease. Unfortunately, T cell response then goes down to very low during the course of the infection and only comes up high again, very late in the disease when the B cells and the immune system starts to have trouble. Um, if you know we have a patient with poor B cell function, we don't expect a positive serology you can do a T cell test and get a positive T cell. So here's one of those cases where you can have a seronegative patient who shows positive on the T cell test. Now, another thing which I like to emphasize when I teach physicians is that what you can do is use this type of test as an indirect measure of the immune system of the patient. We know that people with chronic infections, especially tick-borne infections, um, can have a compromised immune response. So what you do is you do an immunoblot, which is very sensitive serology, basically that reflects B cell function. And you also do this T cell test, again, reflects T cell function. So if you have a known Bartonella patient who is negative on serology and negative on this T cell test, then you know they have a weakened immune system because they have the infection and the immune system's not recognizing. So it's a really handy way for the clinician to see if your immune system's responding to these infections the way it should. Now, none of these tests are 100% sensitive. As I showed you in the beginning, you can have a positive serology and a negative direct test. You can have a positive direct test and a negative serology. Um, so what most people do is they, they order at least a fish and immunoblot, and most also will add the PCR. Again, with P, a B cell dysfunction, you don't expect a positive serology. But again, if you have a weak immune system, you're going to get more organisms, so a fish and PCR is more logical. If you have a low bacterial load, let's say you've been treated and you improve but not completely over it, or you've been treated for Lyme and not Bartonella, may have a lower germ load, then you don't expect a fish or PCR to be positive, but you do expect immunoblot and maybe even the T cell test to show. Again, early disease that favors a direct test like a fish and PCR, and again, the T cell response. Now, this is the thing. These tests, the fish, the PCR, and the immunoblot are very, very specific. So if you're a doctor or if you're a physician, you order these three tests and say one of the three is positive or two of the three are positive, 
you believe the positive because it's very specific. You don't believe the negative if there's a positive in there because again, very, very specific and not always sensitive. Treatment, very, very difficult. First of all, as I said, many different species, each species may have a different antibiotic susceptibility profile and you can be co-infected with more than one species. Ed Breitschwitz showed that very, very clearly. These can be in the blood vessels, they can be deep in the tissues, they can be within cells, and you have to have antibiotics that work in all these places and, and you know, antibiotics don't. Um, the biofilms that protect the Bartonella from the medications and from the immune system. There's also what's called the stationary phase, a form of hibernation. The organism, Lyme does this too, Bartonella can go into a form of hibernation. And the thinking is that when they're not growing, they're not going to be able to be killed by conventional antibiotics. Antibiotics affect the growth of the germ. So if they're not growing, they're just kind of hibernating, that aids trouble. So this is why none of the antibiotics are universally effective. If you look up treating Bartonella in the medical journals, you find the published data is really bad. I was shocked when I went through this. They ignore intracellular organisms, they ignore stationary phase, they ignore biofilm Bartonella, um, they mostly do things in test tubes, not in living organisms. So if you have a germ like Bartonella that goes deep into tissues, into your bone, into your cartilage, what you see in a test tube may not reflect what happens in the real world. Now, more recently, there are some better studies that are addressing these gaps and the errors, and we'll talk about that in a second. Another problem, though, is that Bartonella germs are capable of developing antibiotic resistance pretty quickly because they actually contain genetic mechanisms to do that. This is especially true of the Marcolite family like azithromycin and so forth, and the quinolones like Cipro and Leviquin. So let's go through the antibiotics. We know that at least in a test tube or in the bloodstream, cell wall drugs like cephalosporins and augmentin, um, they can be very good because they're bactericidal. They kill the germ when they're there, but they only work in the blood vessels and intravascular space, not good in the tissues and don't, certainly don't go into the cells. Um, for a cell wall drug to work, they have to resist the enzyme beta-lactamase, beta-lactam, which is present in these organisms, so it has to be lactamase resistant. So cell wall drugs might look good in the test tube, but they don't really work that well to cure Bartonella. They can suppress it, but not cure it. The quinolones, that's like Cipro, Leviquin, they're very good. However, every isot that they tested in this one article became resistant after several numbers of subcultures. Um, and as a lot of you know, Quinolones can cause side effects in the tendons and, and irritability, more irritability in the central nervous system. A lot of people try and avoid them for that reason. The macrolides like azithromycin, they seem to work great in the test tube, but rapid development of resistance was seen, again, because of genetic mechanisms within the Bartonella. Um, and that's why people nowadays are using combinations of treatment, and I'll show you that in a second, because it makes resistance less of a problem. Rifampin is a very commonly used drug, but it's weak, it's bactericidal, not bactericidal. In other words, it inhibits, but doesn't kill the drug when it's used by itself. It also has side effects within your body. It induces liver enzymes to clear medications and even your hormones out of your body more quickly. So people who are on other medications besides rifampin, they find those drugs don't work as well. They have to adjust the dose maybe. And you can become hormone deficient because your hormones are cleared more quickly. And people who have been sick a long time with marginal reserves of their adrenal gland can have troubles because of that and may need cortisone type drugs to support their adrenal function um, while they're on rifampin. The tetracyclines, I love this quote, came from Ed Breitschwert. If you know Ed Breitschwert, you know he's a brilliant, brilliant man. He says, <laughs> you cannot float a cat, a dog, a horse, or a human in enough doxycycline to eliminate Bartonella Hensley. And I'm just visualizing someone sitting in a bad tub full of doxycycline. Anyway, so tetracyclines as a single agent apparently don't work. Now, gentamicin is an IV drug. It's been around a long, long time. And there's a lot of good literature on this. They belong to the class called aminoglycosides. And the quote is that patients receiving aminoglycoside were more likely to fully recover. These are patients who have the heart involvement. And those treated with aminoglycoside for at least 14 days were more likely to survive than those with shorter therapy with a significant probability there. However, it doesn't penetrate into the central nervous system and can be toxic um, to the hearing and to the kidneys, especially if you combine it with a macrolide like azithromycin. So it's a drug you have to be careful of, but it doesn't mean you can't use it. 
about the resistance, again, this shows you the genetic mechanisms in Bartonella that can make it resistant to erythromycins, such as azithromycin, which is why it can fail, and the fluoroquinolones. In fact, they found all isolates that they tested became resistant after a few subcultures. So they put in the culture, they let it grow, then they take something that, put it in another culture, and they sort of bring it along as if it went from take to different animals. And so by mimicking that, they found that over time, um, they became resistant to the fluoroquinolones. So that's a big problem. Now, the stationary phase, that hibernation that I mentioned, here's a quote from the article. Rifampin, erythromycin, azithromycin, doxy, and cipro, they seem to work well during the growing Bartonella with the growth phase, but they had poor activity against the stationary phase. Drug like daptomycin, methylene blue, which is a, a dye, and gentamicin, they completely eradicated the stationary phase, at least in the test tube. Streptomycin did, but we don't use it anymore because it's a very toxic drug and it's given an IM painful shot. Clotrimazole is an anti-yeast medication that's a um, tablet to use to clear your mouth. It's something that doesn't absorb into the bloodstream and it's not available as a shot or as an IV, so that doesn't count. So adaptomycin, methylene blue, and gentamicin as single agents can work against the stationary phase. But again, this is in vitro, patient results may differ. Here's a series of articles on using combinations of antibiotics. Ciprogent and nitrofurantine were active. Methylene blue and rifampin were very good against the biofilm. And the drug combinations, azithro and cipro, azithro and methylene blue, rifampin and cipro, and rifampin and methylene blue, they can kill both the stationary phase and the biofilm phase. And this again is in vitro, um, in tissue, you know, not in humans, but in, 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 in the lab. So this is very encouraging, but it's not a gold standard. So what is this methylene blue? You know, you can talk a long time about it and I don't wanna waste the time on just this one topic, but methylene blue is a dye that has been found to be as an, an antibiotic as well as an oxidant. And this is one practitioner who just took this quote to give you an example of what's being done. And this person said, I use methylene blue routinely along with Zithromax, Bactrim, Rifampin and others, not all at once, and I always check G6PD levels. G6PD is an enzyme that we all pretty much carry. However, some people are deficient of it and the deficiency of this um, can make someone have a very toxic and even life-threatening reaction to methylene blue. So you have to have a blood test to measure your G6PD level first before you start taking it. Also, this person says methylene blue with Bartonella herbs is great as well. For example, A-Bart, which is from Byron White, bar one and bar two, which is from uh, Beyond Balance. BLT is from Research Nutritionals, um, I believe. Oregano, berberine, biocidin, and others. Major game changes start low and titrate up. This person uses 100 to 150 milligrams twice a day. Others don't use this much, others use more. As I mentioned, they can cause severe oxidative stress to so make sure they take antioxidants and you get it from compounding pharmacists. So that's the nutshell of methylene blue. A lot of people are trying to use it now and getting some experience. But there's some other interesting things I'm gonna to talk to you about. Arginine, the very simple amino acid. Number one, it's been found to moderate TNF. In other words, inhibit the inflammation of, um, caused by a Bartonella infection. It also prevents activation of those drug resistance genes. So the thinking is if you use arginine, simple non-prescription amino acid you can get from vitamin shop, along with your antibiotic, you may not end up getting the drug resistance. The only drawback to arginine is that if you have a herpes virus infection, it can reactivate it. Um, adding lysine and other amino acid to, to balance it out can help to prevent that from happening. How long do you treat Bartonella? Here's an article. Minimum treatment is three to four months. Um, Any one less than 15 days relapses pretty much for common and therefore treatment should be given to three to four months. This comes from literature, backs up pretty much what we see clinically. Now there's more to treating Bartonella than antibiotics. You need to what I call a comprehensive approach. You see chronic illness will have negative effects on your metabolism, negative effects on your ability to detoxify and negative effects on your immunity. And if you don't correct these, you're not gonna have successful treatment for any of the tick-borne diseases and definitely not for Bartonella, which is so hard on the system. So regimens that are successful include the pharmaceutical drugs, but also nutritional support, and even those botanical herbs I mentioned briefly. So 
what's done is you start by supporting energy production, you rescue the mitochondria. And it's because energy production is what is necessary to have a normal immune response. You add in detoxification regimens. Toxins in our system are often fat soluble or they're metals and they can also impair energy production and immune response. Inflammation is a result of infection. It's what the body uses to try and clear it. But in these chronic tick-borne and Bartonella type infections, the inflammation doesn't always work to clear the infection. And in fact, inflammation paradoxically inhibits the immune system further. So you want to curb excess inflammation and support the immune function. So we'll talk about the herbals. Here's an article, one of several, that shows that there are herbals that have proven toxic to both growing and stationary Bartonella, and even working against the biofilm form. Cryptolepis, black walnut, which is um, Another one found to be effective, polygonium, which is Japanese knotweed. These are the three top ones from that article. Others have found berberine and SAE to be helpful too. And the recommendation is if you're gonna use herbs, you need to use at least two of them together, um, I guess, to broaden the spectrum and to prevent resistance. So when you engineer a treatment protocol, what you wanna do is address energy production and detoxification before you start the antibiotics and antimicrobials. Again, this will support the mitochondria, which you need to have good energy production to kill the Bartonella. Um, a regimen I recommend always, and I have taken it myself when I was treated, um, a combination of a multivitamin called Physician's Daily, um, ATP360, which is mitochondrial support, and Energy Multiplex, which is an overall supporter. <laughs> and I would take the three of them together. These are made by research nutritionals. Very important tip here, never take regular vitamin B6 you should only take what's called P5P, pyridoxal 5-phosphate. It turns out B6 is thought to be important for nerve function and, and body health in general, but it turns out B6 is a pre-vitamin, a pro-vitamin. It doesn't have any activity. It's converted into P5P in our bodies. But there's a paradox here. There's a negative feedback. If you take B6, it inhibits that enzyme, so you get less P5P. So the paradox is the more B6 you take, the less active vitamin you have, and people taking high dose of B6 can actually clinically appear to have B6 deficiency with neuropathy and fatigue. So never take regular B6 if you have chronic illness, only take compounds that have P5P instead of B6. Um, that's a clue that I think you should all know about. All right, detoxification. Glutathione is important, can be given IV, but nowadays liposomal vitamin uh, glutathione is available and that absorbs very well and has been shown to work in peer-reviewed published um, articles. Um, the glutathione helps to mobilize the toxins to get rid of them out of the body. You use binders that bind them in the GI tract and down the drain, goes, down the, drain. Um, the ones that I've seen work are toxin pull, toxies bind, and others are several on the market. And to increase liver clearance, so things called toxies, pure body clear, a number of other ones that are herbal based, and they help clear the, the toxins. To dampen inflammation without impairing the immune system, you have to avoid steroids. People often use herbal combinations, Cytoquel, IMNB, Calm, et cetera. Modified citrus pectin is a very important thing that's been discovered and being used more nowadays. You can use the non-steroidal drugs like the ibuprofens and so forth, but I don't recommend them as a long-term answer. They can be used intermittently as a booster. They really should not be used daily and long-term. It's only intermittently. If, if significant immune dysfunction is found, that has to be addressed as well. Again, glutathione has been shown to increase CD57 levels. There are articles on that. Transfer factors support T cell function. They're found in colostrum. So there's a thing, a product called transfer factor multi-immune that has both in it, uh, plus some other factors. And you can get specific transfer factors out of four Bartonella in addition. So this is used when you have patients with low CD57s and, and chronic illness. Yeast overgrowth, very important to attack that. Why? Well, yeast will colonize the GI tract and will ferment the carbohydrates into alcohols and other organic chemicals, which are definitely not good for your health, especially when you're sick. But the other thing is yeast in the GI tract will form thick biofilms. And those biofilms will harbor the DNA viruses that we see so commonly reactivated, such as HHV6, Epstein-Barr, and so forth. There's articles on this. So, Yeast biofilms, candida biofilms in the gut can actually make the viruses more of a problem. So it's very important to try and attack, attack that. What I found is that taking probiotics alone doesn't work. 
taking probiotics, even with anti-yeast medications, prescription or prescription, that doesn't work. And why not? Yeast infections start in the mouth. So every time you swallow, you're going to repopulate the GI tract. So what you have to do is use oral antiseptics. Um, and the ones that I recommend basically make yourself, it's called a modified Dakin solution, D-A-K-I-N. And that's actually made from chlorine bleach, very, 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 very diluted. And um, you use that to cleanse the mouth. And then what you need to do is immediately put the good germs back in. Um, there's a new product called Oramax, which is a dissolvable um, tablet. You let it dissolve in your mouth and it puts a beneficial bacteria back into the mouth directly. The other alternative is kefir. It's not quite as good, but it's another alternative because if you don't put the good germs back, once you've used an antiseptic, then the bad germs are gonna come back. So you wanna crowd them out. Minimizing GI yeast, Saccharomyces, Alimacan, Biocide, and all the other ones. Of course, there are prescription drugs as well. And then the, um, the probiotics, you wanna use a combination product that's soil-based as well as the spores and live strains. And basically what I have people do is rotate through several different brands over time to get the most, most benefit. So typical regimen, the theory is that if you combine an antibiotic like azithromycin, which is known to be prone to developing resistance, if you combine that with either other antibiotics or the herbals, then the resistance is less likely to occur. Again, dead germs don't mutate. Okay, so example, start with azithromycin, 500 to 1,000 milligrams a day, good solid dose, and you add to that cryptolepis and polygonium. So you have the two botanicals that you need plus the um, pharmaceutical. Logical to add transfer factor and arginine to boost the immune system and keep the germs from allowing them the uh, mutation. As I showed you, a lot of others will add methylene blue, rifampin, and, and or doxycycline, so you have two or three drug regimen. If you're gonna go for a fluoroquinolone, Cipro and Leviquin, in my experience, Leviquin is more effective than Cipro, but they both can be just as toxic to tendons, so you have to be careful. Now, for patients who are very ill, and for those who have endocarditis, gentamicin is the drug of choice. And that would replace azithromycin because you can't use the two together because they have similar toxicities, which add up. And obviously, you need to um, add some other things like botanicals. Now, the interesting thing is adding botanicals like the cryptolepis and polygonium, which has been proven to work at least in vitro, may not need to use something that's toxic, um, you know, like, um, like dapsone-type drugs or ones that are like gentamicin. So it's a very interesting trend nowadays to use combination therapy, not different pharmaceuticals, but pharmaceuticals plus botanicals. So I'm gonna run out of time soon because I wanna give you time for questions. So basically the summary is this. It's a clinical picture of both neuropsychiatric and soft tissue symptoms put together that's out of proportion to what you see in Lyme disease. Diagnosis can be difficult. Again, there's no one hard clinical finding other than the uh, tracks, the Barnell tracks. So you need to rely on clinical suspicion, all the clues I talked about, and a panel approach to testing. We're gonna combine different types of tests, perhaps from different labs taken at different times. Treatment is not straightforward. You know, as I spent time showing you, you really have to emphasize supportive measures if you're chronically sick, because antibiotics and anti-Bartonella medicines alone are not gonna help you if your immune system is down. So supportive measures, combination of antibiotics, as I've shown you, is really important, um, especially for established disease. Be alert for drug resistance if someone's on treatment and you're improving, improving, then you hit kind of a, a plateau or you start to regress, you have to think about changing the regimen. Likewise, if you have success and you relapse, you go back on the same medication again, it may not work as well the second time. You have to consider changing the, uh, the regimen. Compound tooth therapies have now been documented to work. I mean, for years we've heard from the herbalists um, and the compound tree doctors that you really should try these herbs, but now we have proof of them that they can work and specific ones that have been shown to work. And it's a complementary therapy that may re replace some toxic alternatives. And the final thing is, you know, one of the reasons why you're listening to me today is to learn about it. I always tell my patients, you have to be educated. You have to be at least as educated as the doctors in terms of the primary care doctors who probably turned you away, <laughs> you probably learn more than they know about it. And that's really, really important because you wanna know what to expect. You wanna be able to participate in your treatment um, and work as a therapeutic alliance, because that's so important. If you don't do that, you're not gonna get better. 
So at this point, I'm going to stop. I thank you for, for joining us. And I'm going to turn it back over to our host so we can go through some Q&A. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Barascano. I will first ask that you stop sharing your screen just so okay. uh, we can. There we go. Perfect. Awesome. So I didn't realize how dark it was in my room. The sun is going down. Wait, I've got a, a ring light I can make. There I am. Hey, how it always you? happens for me as well, especially once you get started this time of the year. It's yeah, I'm on the East Coast. Uh, <laughs> uh, so let me first say I've seen a lot of questions about will these uh, will we be able to get these slides? Is this presentation able to be reviewed afterwards? Uh, one I can answer is that yes, this is being recorded. Everybody who is registered or signed up will receive a direct link to this YouTube video tomorrow morning. And we will also be promoting it via our social media and newsletter. So if uh, you aren't signed up and you're watching via Facebook Live, uh, you'll be able to get the direct link to the video as well. So just wanted to cover that. I know that was a couple of questions we had received. Uh, secondly, I've seen a lot of huge thanks and shout outs to you, Dr. burris for the information <laughs> you shared to this point. Uh, so I wanted to share that as well. And let's jump back into the questions. So the first one uh, that I'm seeing here is, can Bartonella be the primary driver of EDS type symptoms, which they have put in parentheses, being connective tissue or skin? Or is that more related to Borrelia? I think it's more Bartonella. I mean, Borrelia likes cartilage and it likes collagen and it likes hyaluronic acid, the basic makeup of the... Um, the connective tissues, but it doesn't do the damage that Bartonella does. I mean, if you saw Bartonella tracks, the skin is actually depressed and thin because the Bartonella, I mean, in layman's terms, is actually chewing up the collagen, chewing up the connective tissues. So I really think for EDS, you really have to think of Bartonella. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, we also have a question from Deb is, are you seeing overlap at all with long COVID? And is that driving any new thoughts about diagnosis or misdiagnosis in the space? Well, you know, when COVID, or I should say when post COVID became really more and more and more of an issue, I surveyed a number of clinicians, people who I trust and I know are good and dedicated and almost universally, they say in post-COVID, they find reactivation of Bartonella. Among other things, they find reactivation of the DNA viruses too, but they find reactivation of Bartonella. Now, the dilemma is testing because, you know, post-COVID often involves depressed immunity. So serologies are usually pretty useless. You have to go right away to an immunoblot or a PCR or a fish, and probably all three, um, if that's affordable and doable. Um, and just as an aside, also look for the DNA viruses, EBV, HHV6, and CMV. So a good follow-up to that comes from Nadia, which is asking about testing. She said, what about the, it, I believe it's Ellis spot is what she is mentioning. What about the Ellis spot test for Bartonella? The Ellis spot test is a T cell test. Um, that's what I had mentioned in one of the slides. It's very useful in early, early disease and very late disease. And it's also useful in people who have a dysfunction of the immune system where the B cells may not be functioning so well. So it's useful. It's not as sensitive as the others, but if you use it during the right time, in other words, very late and very early disease, then it's helpful. And one more time, you know, if you use that along with a B cell based test like the immunoblot and they're both negative, when you have a positive fish or PCR, then you know your immune system is down. So it's an indirect measure of immune function, which is why I like to do that too. Perfect, perfect. I think uh, looks as late, and some of these questions came in throughout your presentation, so you may have covered information afterwards, uh, but these came in relatively recently and they are all related to uh, the use of supplements. So the first is uh, see that supplements mention immune support. However, how do you uh, measure how the immune is actually the immune system is actually strengthened. Well, that's <laughs> the tricks. First of all, going way to back to the beginning, when I first evaluate a chronic Lyme patient, a chronic Bartonella patient, chronic TBD patient, um, before I do anything treatment-wise, I do a, an assessment of the immune function, and you measure the B cells by measuring the immunoglobulin levels. You test a quantitative serum immunoglobulin and you do the IgG subclasses. 
and you look for deficiencies in any of those things. Then you look for T cell function. It's, it's a test called a mitogen stimulation assay. Your blood is taken to the lab and is kept alive in a special test tube. And then they test the T cells against different things to see how well they respond. So those are the two tests you do at baseline. And then um, you can retest during or after treatment. And in the case of someone, say a post-COVID patient, where you may not have a baseline test, it's still worthwhile to do the two. Because again, they're two parts of the immune system, the B cells and the T cells. We also know that the killer cells play a role. There are two different killer cells that we often measure, the CD56, which is more associated with the chronic fatigue, um, viral mycoplasmal type situation, and the CD57, which is more commonly seen in Lyme and Bartonella patients. Um, the thing is that CD56 is a precursor to CD57. So typically you see Lyme and apparently Bartonella too will inhibit that maturation. So you can measure both the CD56 and the CD57 to see if there's an inhibition of the switchover. So again, you got the T cells, the B cells, and the killer cells. Awesome, measuring the full body, I see. Uh, so we have another question here from Judith Leventhal. Uh, she mentioned that it can be difficult to distinguish between herxes or adverse reactions from drugs. And many patients may also have MCAS-like reactions. Is there any tips for how you may proceed in these cases? I believe Judith is a, a practitioner herself. Yeah. Hi, Judy. How are you? <laughs> Good to see you again. You're not there visibly. Anyway, um, one obvious thing is timing of it. Herxheim reactions don't happen immediately. They usually happen two to three days into treatment, and it's dose-related, and it's by history if they've had that kind of reaction before to treatments. So that's a simple thing, but not always helpful. Um, another thing is you can look for what kind of reaction it is. Herxheimer usually is an increase in current symptoms or a reappearance of older symptoms that you had before that may have rotated away. Whereas adverse effects may be more like allergic type things, uh, mast cell reactivation, GI side effects that are more typical of a side effect of the drug. So it's number one, the clinical picture, and number two, the timing. Awesome, uh, let's see. Uh, we're we're doing pretty well on time. I Good. first off, you you ran through that real quick, so you you definitely helped beat the uh, the time clock there. Yeah, so you I know I was worried because I had so much information. I was through it, so I'm glad that you're going to be able to give this to people to look at once again. I mean, if I was in the audience, I would say, "What did he say?" <laughs> <laughs> I'd have to go back over the time or two and, and figure it out. So yeah, yeah I, thank you for recording this. Agreed. I think it'll be beneficial for people to rewatch. And like I said, we will definitely be sending it back around. I will take uh, one or two more questions here and then we can wrap up for the evening. So All right. uh, the first is I see for children who have PANS, Lyme, and Bartonella who have had aggressive treatment, what would you recommend as the next step if they're continuing to struggle? Well, you know, you have to look for the cause of it and infections are part of it. Um, a body that's not healthy is part of it. Now that sounds really a ridiculous thing to say. Of course you're not healthy. You've got Bartonella in line. Um, but what I start to talk about at the end of the presentation, getting the, what we call the protoplasm, getting the body healthier, look for what's toxic in the system. Um, you know, years ago I was sick with these things and I had toxins in my body I couldn't imagine. I had glyphosate, which is Roundup, and I'm not a farmer. <laughs> How did that happen? I eat organic food, but it's in our food supply. I had toxicity from cadmium, which is a heavy metal that is used in industrial processes, not even used in America anymore because of its toxicity. How did I get cadmium? Well, the body loses its ability to remove toxins when you're chronically sick. So as I mentioned in the slides, you gotta get the body healthier. You have to look for and remove toxins. You have to look for metabolic problems. Simple taking your temperature, looking at your thyroid function. You could have normal thyroid function, but act like a low thyroid because your metabolism is slow, your mitochondria are not healthy. You support them as much as you can. I mean, the whole list, you go through the whole thing. Next, next, what you want to do is using tests like the Cunningham panel that measures inflammation um, and anti-neuronal antibodies. You can see how much of the disease is still active because Bartonella especially will trigger off autoimmune type reactivity, which is what that is. 
And if the antibiotic and antibiotic treatments and anti Lyme treatments haven't gone far enough, then you have to use immune modulators. Number one on the list, of course, is IV gamma globulin, which is hard to get coverage for. Um, another thing that has been used, and I've seen it used um, with some success, is hydroxychloroquine. Um, controversial drug, but very non-toxic, and it can modulate the immune system as well. And in the last worst case scenario, there's always steroids. If, as long as there's a good course of antibiotics um, on board, especially with some herbal support, you can get away with occasional bursts of steroids to tone the thing down. So it has to be thorough, has to be detailed, and you have to kind of work your way through it. Awesome. So I think a uh, great question I always love to wrap up with, and actually one of our oh, audience members, Patricia, uh, put this in the Q&A slot, which is, is there any hope that mainstream physicians will become more accepting of the existence of this disease and its role in complicating one's health? Uh, and I will build upon that with an organizational perspective as well, is what can an, a group like Project Lyme do to help push the envelope on the acceptance of, of Bartonella? Well, you know, a um, very interesting, interesting thing happened a couple of weeks ago. Um, I was invited to teach medical students. So I thought that was awesome. great because, you know, right now I'm spending a lot of my time teaching physicians who have been trained probably in the wrong way, or at least outdated you know, information. Um, and so you have to have them unlearn things and then relearn. But um, the Illinois Lyme group, um, which is very active politically and they've gotten laws changed to benefit the doctors treating Lyme patients, um, have gotten involved with the medical school, University of Chicago Medical School. And I was invited to give a, a webinar like this um, on, on diagnosing Lyme disease. And it was very well received and hopefully the beginning of more of it. So from both an organizational point of view and an individual point of view, trying to get the medical schools to accept a lecture from someone who's an ILAD stock or knows about this is very, very important first step because then it becomes institutionalized. And um, that's the way to do it. Teach them young. <laughs> Awesome. I like that a lot because it offers both a practical solution and a message of hope that we see, yeah. as you mentioned, at least some more acceptance coming from a lot of the work that so many advocates have put in and also some concrete steps that we as an organization and all of the hundreds of attendees who are with us today could potentially do to, to push the envelope and move the, the issue forward. So thank you so much, Dr. Boroscano, for taking the time to present this webinar today. I think it was extremely well received. And as I mentioned, will be shared with our community. Uh, you covered a lot of very impactful information and thank you again for uh, lending your expertise to Project Lyme this evening. I'm happy to do it. And thank you for all the work you do in your organization. Group, great group of people, a lot of good stuff that they've done and um, keep up the good work. Awesome, thank you so much. And I'm uh, looking forward to our next time. Bye-bye. Uh, likewise, thanks. Take care, I'm gonna leave now. <laughs>